Jerusalem, the Contested City Lecture 14 From Then to Now The Holy Places in the Present Age Almost everything about Jerusalem is in dispute and controversial, and that includes the population. Who, exactly how many people are in, in Jerusalem and to which of the religious groups they belong has been a matter of dispute for some time, since the city is now being contested between two of these groups, at least, Muslims and Jews. As far as we can tell, and it's very difficult to make estimates in anything short of modern times about populations, as far as we can tell, the, the population of Jerusalem in, in 1806, according to the estimate of one very reliable traveler, the population was 8,700 people who were living in Jerusalem, of which about half of which were Muslims. This is, this is considerably greater than it was already in the previous century, when Jerusalem must have reached its low point of perhaps about 3,000 people. Uh, that that's, has to be the lowest population that the city had for a very, very long time. So, But in the course of the 19th century, the population gradually ascends in Jerusalem for a variety of reasons. Better health, the birth rate begins to increase, there are more people coming in from the outside, but they're not, they're not all the same people. For example, in 1870, it is estimated the population was 22,000 people in the old city. Well, I'm constantly talking about the old city here, the city within the walls today. There is another Jerusalem growing up at the same time to the west of this one, the, the, the West Jerusalem or the New Jerusalem, but that's, that's a whole other topic which I'll get to somewhat later. So, from 8,700 people in 1806 to 22,000 in 1870. But what is significant about this is of this latter 22,000, 6,500 of them were Muslims, 4,500 were Christians, and 11,000 were Jews, which means that the Jewish population in 1870 amounted to half the population of the old city, while the Muslim percentage and the Christian percentage had decreased the Jewish population had increased. Now, a lot of this was immigration, people coming from Europe, and frequently the causes of immigration, Jewish immigration from Europe, are pogroms that are being conducted there. There are troubles in Europe, and the people begin to migrate to this, to this land, not necessarily in the prospects of a better life, but certainly of a, of a different life. The, the motivation is almost generally religious. Because nobody was saying this was the promised land at this stage. This was this was a hard life in in Jerusalem. The people who were in charge of of the city were, were the Ottomans. The Ottomans had been in control of the city from 1517 down to the end of the First World War. It was theirs to administer and theirs to control, and they made the decisions about this, that, or the other. Nobody contested the Ottoman possession of Jerusalem, and no one contested the Ottoman possession of Palestine. But the Ottomans, for all that, were part of a much larger stage. Right? They, were, they were part of the great power play, great powers play of the 19th century, and they were growing increasingly weaker as a, as a polity, and the European powers were growing increasingly stronger. So the Ottomans were, in the eyes of the Europeans at least, coming to the end of their term. And the Eastern question uh, that dominated thinking in the 19th century was, what is to become of the Ottomans? Where, who is to absorb this? Who is to get what share of this, this corpse, this political corpse that is approaching its end time? But in the meantime, the Ottomans still had to control the city and still, still ruled it. Uh, and they had to make decisions about the holy places in the city. And it, is, it, was become per, it had become perfectly clear to the Ottomans in the 19th century that the decisions they made were no longer simply, could no longer simply be arbitrary on their part. They could just simply decide to do this rather than that. That there were all sorts of people watching them, that, that the whole European power structure was watching them, that there were so many vested interests outside of Jerusalem that were concerned with what was happening inside Jerusalem, that the Ottomans had to proceed very, very cautiously, and that decisions that they made in, during this period of time in the 19th century had long-term repercussions, although they they were not aware of it. And some of these decisions 
were remained in place, decisions made by the Ottomans were remained in place longer than the Ottomans themselves. The Ottomans have disappeared from the political scene, so have their successors, the Turks, but some of these decisions made in the 19th century are still standing. They had to decide precisely about two holy places, the chief holy place of the Christians, namely the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and the Western Wall, the chief holy place of the Jews. Church of the Holy Sepulchre is called by the Easterners the Anastasis, or the Church of the Resurrection. And it was, as long as anyone could remember, it was contested among among the Christians. Not possession of the building so much as the interior. Uh, the building was built by Constantine originally, and who was an Eastern Christian, and the clergy in the church were for a very long time the Greek clergy. This was an Eastern Christian building, an Eastern Christian operation. And with the Crusades, however, Westerners came in, the Latins took over the church, they expelled the Greeks, and after the Crusades, the Greeks returned. And as we've seen, eventually the Latins returned as well. So here are on the scene two groups of Christians, Eastern Orthodox Greek Christians and Western Latin Roman Catholic Christians who have no love lost between them, contesting for the possession of this church and for many of the other Christian holy places in Palestine, throughout Palestine. And the interior of the church in the period after the Crusades if we, if we open the inside of the church and take a look at it in the period after the Crusades, we can see that the center part of the church is controlled by the Greeks. This main, what we would call the nave of the church, called the Catholicon, is, is Greek property and run by the Greek clergy. It's the part that faces the small tomb of Jesus. The small, it's, it's called an edicule. It's a house and the way it appears now, it's a house under a dome surrounded by large columns. And it's in its present form, it is the result of a reconstruction of that part of the church which followed a disastrous fire in 1808. And so that's, that's when you look at the, the Holy Sepulchre today, that's what you're seeing. Anyway, the Greek part of the church is the part immediately facing that. To the left of that or to the north of it is a chapel to Mary Magdalene, commemorating the place where she uh, confronted Jesus upon his resurrection. That's in possession of the Franciscans, the Latin, the Latin Roman Catholics. And to the south of that, the, the entry to the, to the Church of the Holy Sepulcher is the, is the chapel of Golgotha and surrounding chapels, a large part of which is controlled by the Armenians. And these are the three main presences in the Church of the Holy Sepulcher the Greeks in the middle, and the Armenians on one side, and the Latins on the other. These are the two largest Christian communities in Jerusalem, and the most prosperous and the most powerful. And that gathered around the back of the sepulcher itself are a series of small chapels, which sort of edge, which sort of nestle against the, the holy sepulcher itself. And in these chapel are, chapels are sorted some of the smaller groups, that is to say, the Coptic Christians of Egypt, the Jacobite Christians of Syria, the Chaldean Christians of, of, um, of Iraq. Right, so these smaller groups have their positions sort of clustered, pushed in there. And then the, the most unfortunate of all, perhaps, in terms of, of turf, are the Abyssinians. There was a long-standing controversy between the Coptic Christians and the Abyssinian Christians about in their in their own homelands of who is you know jurisdictional rights etc cetera, etc cetera. and this has been transferred to the church of the holy sepulcher and long standing opposition to the abyssinians has forced them to hold their place in the church they are actually on the roof of the church of the holy sepulcher and there is a place that they can look down and see the holy sepulcher from the roof but their chapel is on the roof of the church and in fact their clergy live up there uh, that everybody, as I mentioned in an earlier lecture, everybody has to stay in the church. There always has to be a constant presence because uh, possession is, is more than nine points of the law in, in this place. And that if you leave your place, if you, do, if, if, if you vacate, somebody else is going to take it. So the entire history in post-Crusader history of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is nothing more than a kind of relentless discussion and, and acts of violence on who is to control what part of that church, that the constantly these religious groups, five or six or seven of them, are jostling inside the church for 
possession of one part of the turf or other, or watching to make sure that their rights are not abrogated or abridged in any way. So that anything that goes on in the church, and there are there are constantly there's kind of liturgies going on, there are processions, there are ceremonies going on, all of which have to be scheduled very carefully, that they don't coincide, they don't conflict with each other, and also that any sort of, and this is the more serious thing probably, any sort of alteration in the church is regarded as an act of of ownership. If you change something, that you are in effect exercising proprietorship over it. So that repairs in the church are are a matter of extreme delicacy and, and very often neglected or passed by simply because the parties cannot agree as to who is to do these. Because, as I say, it suggests proprietorship if you get to do them. Now, one example of this I've already mentioned. In 1808, this was fought, this terrible fire that had bre- broken out. And the church had to be repaired. The dome was going to collapse and the columns were, were shaky. It looked like the whole, the whole holy sepulcher might be destroyed. So alterations did have to be made, repairs, and substantial. And as it turned out, the Greek Orthodox did it at that point, because at that precise point, it was the Greek Orthodox who had the ear of the sultan, who had the, the superior place in the hierarchy in the church, all of which cost money. I mean, these positions... Primacy costs money inside the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And so they held a position, so they got to redecorate major parts of the church, the parts that we essentially see today. So this went on. This went on constantly, and including scenes of violence and scenes of actual mayhem inside the church, until finally it got to the point that it reached the, the Ottoman authorities had to make some sort of decision. What is interesting about this is that the Muslims to this day control possess the keys to the church, so that, in a sense, it's it's an indication that it's their property. Who owns the Church of the Holy Sepulchre? Who knows who owns the Church of the Holy Sepulchre? The Muslims have the keys, and the interior is divided up among these, among these religious groups. So people own parts of the church, but nobody seems to own the church itself, or maybe the Muslims do. There is a Muslim family who, to this day, has the keys to the Holy Sepulchre. At any rate, The Ottomans, as the rulers of Jerusalem, had to make a decision about this controversy that was going on about the inside of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And there were lawsuits being carried on until finally the Ottoman Sultan in 1852 issued a decree or a firman, as as they're called, saying that, that everybody inside the church should remain precisely in place, the place where they were, with their own rights and privileges, as they were, they would maintain the status quo right, until a further adjudication was made in terms of settling these disputes. And this famous decree of 1852, the famous status quo, as it's called, is still in effect. That when the, when the, Ottomans, the Ottomans departed without ever making a decision about this, the Brit- they were succeeded by the British, who wanted no part in deciding this, They were followed by the Jordanians, who said, no, thank you. And they were followed by the Israelis, who said, I think not. And so today, it's the Ottoman status quo of 1852, the the, the Sultan's Firman, which is in force in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. The other holy place, the other chief holy place in Jerusalem is is the Western Wall. This has rather curious kind of history. Uh, The holy place of Jerusalem was obviously the temple, the temple and the Temple Mount, Herod's platform and the buildings on top of it. Those buildings on top of the Temple Mount were destroyed in 70, and the Jews were chased out of Jerusalem and Judea in the year 135. Now, around this began to circulate the story of God's presence, which was in the temple. What happened to God's presence, his Shekinah, right, his his spirit? What happened to it? Well, the the story goes that it went went behind the western wall. The original part of the story may have meant that that God had gone beyond the western wall of the city, right, which was still preserved, right, that the Romans had allowed that western citadel to stand as an indication of how powerful a city they had destroyed. That may have been the beginnings of it. But the way this thing eventually settled was that by the western wall, and that God's presence was behind the western wall, meant the western exposed face of Herod's platform. Herod's platform is solid for the most part, and so this is a sheer 
face of very, very large building stones, enormously large building stones, and that that southwestern corner, at the western face of about 90 feet there, was the place behind which God had gone, and that Jews began to worship there. That is to say, they go, went and stood before it and prayed, prayed to the God whose presence was now behind it. And it, we get, we don't, we can't trace this, this devotion throughout the Middle Ages, but it's, but certainly by Ottoman times, it, it, it is the chief place of Jewish worship. Jews by this time were no longer going up on the Temple Mount. And they worship pretty much in, in their own synagogues, in their own yeshivas. They prayed there. But their form of public prayer, all of that they had done privately. And that, because there's a prohibition about building anything new, according to Muslim law, that Jews and Christians cannot put up new edifices. They can, re- can, they can repair old ones, but they can't build new ones. And so the whole business of doing things to synagogues in Jerusalem was very controversial because the, the, the Ottomans kept, kept saying that you're building something and the Jews kept saying, no, no, we're repairing something. But the issue of this wall was a constant sort of, of irritant to both sides. The space of this wall is it's about, it's an alley. It used to be an alley. And it was about no more than 15 feet wide, right? Running from the wall out to the, the, the building line of the um, Muslim houses that ran next to the wall. So there was, a, there was a space between the wall and the beginnings of these houses, and it was no more, as I say, than 15 feet wide and about 90 feet long. It was a closed alley. I was there in 1961. It was very difficult to find. It was not marked at all, and it was a, a small and rather cramped place. Jews were worshipping here all through the 19th century, and they, they came at prayer hours and said their prayers, and occasionally would bring things with them, chairs or a stand to hold the Torah. And all of this was opposed by the Ottoman authorities or the religious authorities. The, the muftis of Jerusalem would, would, would disapprove this because they construed it as building new, new facilities. So when the Jews wanted to repave the area, for example, the Ottomans, the case came to the Ottoman law, law courts because this was understood to be a renovation or a building something new, and that permission was denied, and this went on and on and on. And it went on, uh, actually, as we shall see, until the time that the, that the British took over and tried to settle this question of the wall, wall once and for all. It didn't really work. And the thing about this is that it's, it's the only place for... The Jews to pray in Jerusalem, they felt it was the only place they'd pray. And, but as opposed to earlier discussions like this, there was a Jewish constituency outside of Palestine now that, that the Jews of Jerusalem had support from other places, that the Jews of England, for example, and the Jews of the continent, where now they were wealthy and prominent and politically powerful people who were interested in the plight of their fellow religious in Jerusalem. And so pressures could be brought to bear, as they always had been in Christian cases. If the Christians of Jerusalem were squeezed by the Ottomans or by their predecessors, they could always, the, the European powers, his most Christian majesty of France or his most Catholic majesty of, of Spain, would protest, and some something would be done. But now there are Jewish, wealthy Jews in, in on the continent who are willing to to step up on behalf of the Jerusalem Jews. The Ottomans were cleared out of Jerusalem and of Palestine at the end of the war. They were allied to the Germans during the war. The Germans and and Turks lost the war. And as a result of the great political machinations that took place during and after the war, Palestine became the mandate, which is the technical term, of the League of Nations that was given over to um, Great Britain to administer. And they held, they, they had this mandate between 1922 and 1948 when they vacated it. And so it was now in British hands. The, the, the fate of Palestine and the fate of, of Jerusalem was in the hands of the British. Now, the British were confronted on two sides by one side by uh, the Jews, world Jewry, who, to whom the British, the British had promised in the Balfour, famous Balfour Declaration, a national home for the Jews in Palestine, 
And at the same time, during the same war, they had promised to the Arabs, and more specifically, the Sharif of Mecca, the independence of the Arab lands held by the Ottoman Empire after the war, if the Arabs would join in this revolt against their Ottoman masters, which they did. And so after the war, both of these promises, in effect, came home to to roost with the British. And the British were unable to, I mean, to put it very briefly, unable to sort of con- control this. In 1948, they, they declared their mandate over and they announced they were going to withdraw. And when they withdrew, all the Jewish settlers who had been moving in there fairly consistently during the second, before, during the Second World War and after, uh, rushed in to occupy as much territory as they could and from the east rushed in the Arabs uh, to occupy as much area as they could, the Arabs under the cover of the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan. And so the Hashemites, the Jordanians, got control of the old city, the wall city, and the Israelis, because now the Jews who lived there had, had declared the existence of a Jewish state, the state of Israel. The, the state of Israel and the kingdom of Jordan divided that former mandate territory of Great Britain but on the Jordanian side was the old city of Jerusalem, which remained in their hands between 1948 and 1967. 1967 broke out the, the Six-Day War, so-called, uh, in which the Israelis overran the old city and immediately incorporated it into western Jerusalem, this new and overwhelmingly Jewish city, which lay to the west had started out as a suburb of the old city, but had grown into a city larger than the old city. They reincorporated the two, the two places, made it one city, and declared it the capital of the state of Israel. Right, so that the Muslim control now was, was ended. Right? It had been interrupted by the British mandate, and the Danians restored it, and now it was over. And the Jews, for the first time, controlled Jerusalem and had a political state in that place for the first time since the year six of of the common era, when the Romans absorbed Judea into the Roman Empire. So now it already, now it passes into the hands of the the Israelis, the Jewish Israelis, to make a determination about these things that had so had so troubled the uh, the Ottomans. They too understood the way the Ottomans did that they could no longer just do this stuff unilaterally, that, that, that those days were long, long past, that, that unilateral decisions about holy places. The Israelis had no hesitation about making a unilateral decision about the sovereignty of the city. That was a political decision, purely and simply, which they had no hesitation about making. But as for the fate of the holy places, the Christian, Jewish, and Muslim holy places in, in the city, that was a whole a whole different matter. And it, 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 it arose immediately. As soon as, in June of 1967, the, the Israeli defense forces took possession of the Temple Mount. This whole eastern, the whole old city fell into their hands, including the Temple Mount. And some of the rabbis rushed up to the Temple Mount and began to pray for the first time in a, in, in, in a very, very long time. There were Jews praying atop the Temple Mount And there was this general feeling of exaltation. The wall, there were people praying at the wall. It was tears and joy. And you can imagine the emotions of the scene. But political decisions had to be made almost immediately. And the political decision was made regarding the Temple Mount, by mostly by Moshe Dayan, the then Minister of Defense, that that the Temple Mount was the possession of the Mon people. That is to say, the top of Herod's platform, the Haram al-Sharif, with the Dome of the Rock and the Aqsa Mosque but that the Western Wall, that is to say the face of the Temple Mount, this Western face, was the possession of the Jewish people, or the state of Israel, to be more to be more precise. And that later on that same month, the Knesset, the parliament, the, the Israeli parliament, passed a law called the Law for the Protection of the Holy Places. And this was this guaranteed possession, protection, access to the holy places of all the religious communities, of Jerusalem, and as it was later explained, this law was explained to the that the Christian places, decisions about the Christian places, would be decided by councils of Christians and those of the Muslims by councils of Muslims, and those of for the regarding the Jews by the chief rabbis of Israel. There were two chief rabbis, as in Ashkenazi, 
rabbi for the European Jews and a Sephardic rabbi for those Jews who had lived in Islamic lands, in the, in the abode of Islam, as it's called. And they would make decisions about the Jewish holy places. This was perhaps a wildly optimistic uh, notion, right? The thought that Christians would sit down in a council and decide among themselves the fate of their holy places, something they had never been able to do in the past, or that the Muslims would do this. And as it turned out, the Jews themselves were no more capable of, of doing this. And the bone contention, of course, was the, the, this Western Wall. When the British had replaced the Ottomans in 1922, they, riots broke out eventually because of this increased Jewish migration into Palestine, and the Arabs were beginning to sense that something was going on here, and the, the, the religious sentiment came to a kind of crisis at the Western Wall. And so there were riots and there was violence, and that, to the point that the Jews and the Arabs were fighting so consistently that the British appointed a kind of royal commission to decide on the fate of the, the Western Wall, to, to lay down the laws regarding, not the, not, not the disposition of the wall, but the, the, the access laws regarding, regarding the wall. And in 1931, the, the committee, the commission made its decision, and it was read into law. It was a law of, of or an order of council, as it was called. And it said that the Jews would be free to enter the area of the wall at all times for purposes of prayer, and they were allowed to bring with them certain small ritual articles. Right? So, in effect, it, it, it decided in favor of the Jews. This order of council from 1931 was the order of the day, much, much opposed by the Arab, Muslim Arabs of the area. And it became, was suddenly rendered moot in 1948 when the Jordanians occupied the city. So the law of the order of council was vacated and the Jordanians said who exactly would pray there and when. And there weren't many Jews left in Jerusalem at that stage anyway, in the old city. So they were severely, the Jew, rights of the Jews were severely abridged at that point. In 1967, the, the tide reversed. The Israelis took over the area, and the wall was now theirs, as I said. What they immediately did was they bulldozed without, quickly and without consulting anybody, they bulldozed down all that Muslim housing that had run up to within 15 feet of the wall, clearing a, a large open plaza so that now the whole area was open around the western side of that wall. And then began the trouble. So the question was, what was to be done with this now exposed area? And among, among the Jews, there broke out almost instantly a kind of controversy about, uh, one could put it, I suppose, between the seculars and the religious, that the one, one group thought that the, the, the wall should be declared a synagogue, a holy place, and access to it restricted to in sort of a religious fashion, which is the, the, the point of view that eventually sort of prevails. So today it is, in effect, a, a kind of synagogue. There's a, there's a barrier of segregation between men and women. Men pray on the left or the northern side of this area, and women pray on the south. And so and a certain decorum has to be preserved, and no digging or renovations, et cetera, can take place because this is a holy site. What the archaeologists wanted was that it be declared a, a historical site. There was also a group that wanted to turn it to a national park, right, that could be used for the benefit of the, of the Jewish people. They wanted to sort of secularize it a little bit. The archaeologists wanted to, to excavate purely and simply. And as it turned out, what the decision was made, uh, compromise, they, they divided the, the, the rabbis and the archaeologists sort of divided the area between them that the, the, the northern part of this area became the synagogue, the, the holy place, and then south of the Maghrebi Gate, around the southern western wall and the southern wall of the, the platform, the archaeologists were free to excavate, which they did beginning in 1967, and ironically what they discovered was a large set of, of Muslim buildings. Jews, Christians, and Muslims are agreed on very few things with connection with Jerusalem, but, but one thing they, they do agree on is that the chief events of the last day, the end time, the end of days, will take place in Jerusalem, that the Messiah will come to Jerusalem, all three believe, and that the final judgment will take place there in the valley of Jehoshaphat or the valley of Kedron, which is immediately to the east of the city between the old city and the Mount of Olives. The scenario, the exact scenario for the last days varies among the three, but they all agree that it will take place there. Muslims don't 
care much about this, but Jews and Christians both believe that Israel will somehow have to be restored before the end. And the Jews believe that the temple will have to be restored in the last days. See, Christians check out here because Christians, the Christian vision of the end time believes in the restoration of Israel, which is why a lot of evangelical Christians support Israel so strongly. They see it as a step toward the coming of the, of the Messianic age. But in addition, the Jews believe that the temple in the end time will be rebuilt. They all believe the Messiah will come, because they have obviously different views of who the Messiah is. But the temple, for Jews, the temple will have to be rebuilt. Now, as a matter of fact, Israel has been restored, in a sense, right? In the sense, there is a state there called Israel. Uh, not the children of Israel, however, which is... Uh, and so Jewish and Christian opinion is sort of divided on this. Is, is the restoration of the state of Israel, is it a step toward the end time, or is it, as many believe, a counterindication, a sign that we're turning sort of away from it, because Israel is, in their eyes, a, in the eyes of many pious Jews... A secular state, so it is not part of this religious scenario. But uh, those who do believe that, it is, that the foundation of the state of Israel, and particularly its possession of the Temple Mount, is a step toward the end time, are, some of them at least, are also engaged in what is called hurrying the end. Hurrying the end is a kind of code word used by the rabbis of giving a kind of body English to the end time, to doing, taking certain steps that will bring it about sooner. And the rabbis are constantly warning about against this. And Christians too. I mean, no man knows the day or the hour is a kind of constant theme for Christians. But these people, there's, there's a Jewish group in, in Jerusalem. In fact, there's a thing called the Temple Institute, which is, is itself hurrying the end in that they are preparing for and taking steps for the restoration of the temple and for the anticipated moment when sacrifices will be renewed on the Temple Mount. So the temple is the, the temple and Jerusalem is the sign, is, is the site of the end, right? And it is, it is somehow appropriate that the entire story sort of ends with its focus on precisely this place, not, not only the focus of, of the history of Palestine, the history of the Middle East, but the history of all humankind. Now that you've completed this course, be sure to test your comprehension by taking the final exam. You'll find the exam on this course's webpage. I'm on this course's webpage. I'm on this course's webpage. I'm on this course's